At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. Twenty years after the U.S. launched a devastating war in Iraq, we get an insider account from a whistleblower with first-hand experience working at the Pentagon's Office of Special Plans in the lead-up to the 2003 invasion. We also speak with a Middle East advisor to the war's chief architect, then-Vice President Dick Cheney. Hello and welcome to Inside America with me, Rida Fakhri, as we continue our special coverage of the 20th anniversary of the Iraq War. We speak with a whistleblower with first-hand experience working at the Pentagon's Office of Special Plans in the lead-up to the Iraq invasion. Lieutenant Colonel Karen Katowski also held several positions within the U.S. National Security Council. She retired from the U.S. Air Force after 20 years of service, and she joins me now. Lieutenant Colonel Katowski, uh, you wrote in March 2004, exactly a year after the beginning of the U.S.-led invasion, quote, from May 2002 until February 2003, I observed firsthand the information of the Pentagon's Office of Special Plans and watched the latter stages of the neoconservative capture of the policy intelligence nexus in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq. What was the most alarming thing you witnessed when you worked in that office? I think it was the use of information that often was classified to, uh, to shape a narrative and to be provided directly to mainstream American media as if it was true when in fact it wasn't. So a short answer is the lying, government lying. It was, I, I mean, we hear about it. I actually witnessed it. And for me as, a, as an American, military person, as a patriot, it was very shocking. And many people will use the words uh, false pretenses, mistake, but you say it was actually lying. How much intent was there to manufacture information that simply didn't exist? Among, uh, among the Office of Special Plans and the leadership of the Pentagon, 100% uh, intent to manufacture uh, a storyline uh, to control that storyline and to um, ensure that it was provided to the whole population and to the world uh, as if it was true. And it is not, as many people say, an intelligence failure. Um, it, it was a crushing of the intelligence by the political appointees and by the agenda centers, uh, agenda setters in uh, both the Pentagon and, of course, the National Security Council and the executive suite. How high up the chain of command did this take place? Well, certainly at the vice presidential level with Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney was an active player. And um, in fact, he placed and uh, several appointees directly into the office. My boss was appointed by Dick Cheney. Um, Dick Cheney appointed the uh, members of the National Security Council. Uh, Dick Cheney had a strong influence over George W. Bush. And of course, George W. Bush was part of this. He can't escape it by saying that he wasn't aware. But um, if you want to know the brains behind it, obviously it wasn't George W. Bush, it was Dick Cheney. And um, he uh, uh, played a very active role in all parts of the uh, intelligence community. You know, there are 17 different intelligence agencies, um, Defense Intelligence Agency, CIA, the State Department has uh, uh, an, an intelligence arm and Dick Cheney involved himself in the activities of all of these. So the correct functioning of our intelligence, uh, while it does have flaws, was not really allowed. It was actually purposely corrupted. So yeah, I use the word lie because that's what it was. If there was a plot to go to war, doesn't it somehow feel like some treasonous scheme? Because lying to, to take the country to war is, is treason, isn't it? It is, it is treason, and it's not the first time that we've done it. You know, we have many examples of political lies to, um, to, to shape a domestic uh, opinion, to make it more pro-war, to make it support uh, an unnecessary war. You know, the Gulf of Tonkin with LBJ, I mean, we've, we see that after the fact. Certainly, um, 
those kinds of activities have gone on in previous uh, in previous conflicts and wars. Is the neoconservative ideology still driving foreign policy here in the U.S.? Yes. Oh, absolutely. In fact, we see this in Ukraine on a daily basis. Lieutenant Colonel Karen Katowski, great to have you on the program. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So did the neoconservatives inside the Bush administration purposely deceive the American public and the world into believing that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction when they knew it did not? Joining me now to discuss this is David Wormser, who served as Middle East advisor to former Vice President Dick Cheney. David Wormser, 20 years ago, the U.S. invaded Iraq based on the false pretense that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction. Vice President Dick Cheney, your boss, played a central role in peddling this narrative that many people call outright lies, actively pushing the United States and much of the rest of the world into what was deemed then and what is deemed today an illegal war. Some people who were in government at the time or outside of government believe that Cheney was the key mastermind behind this decision to invade Iraq. Do you agree? Well, I, I do believe that uh, Vice President Cheney had a, had a very strong influence over policy. I don't think he was the only one. I think there was an overwhelming sort of consensus among a number of the people up top, not all, not all, uh, Colin Powell, I, uh, Secretary of State Powell, was not reconciled to it at the beginning. But I think President Bush himself had for quite a while uh, believed that war with Saddam was inevitable. That said, I don't think he ever made that decision final. But, but you said that he had influence, but was it more than that? Did he, more than anyone else, influence, dictate even, the decision to go to war? No, I think I think the decision was with President Bush, and I think he was predisposed already to going to war. I think he was willing to 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 get off that path had Saddam acted certain ways. I think it was it was very clear that if Saddam had come around and exposed whatever was left of what he needed to expose in his weapons of mass destruction programs, he did not feel he had the the justification for going to war. So I think, I think it could have been averted had um, had he done that. But the predisposition. But, but come on, of this isn't this isn't fully um, genuine, is it? This argument, because many people will will say, and the record shows that Vice President Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld and others in government at the time continually pushed the narrative that Saddam Hussein not only possessed biological, chemical, and was actively pursuing nuclear weapons, but he also had ties with Al-Qaeda. We know that not to be true. Well, first of all, yes, there's no doubt that Vice President Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and others were very strongly in favor of going to war. There's, there's not to deny that. But I think the decision still rested with, with, with President Bush, and I don't think he made the final decision. Why were they in favor of going to war? Did well, they the, make the intelligence, the faulty intelligence, fit their agenda? No, the intelligence was was given by the intelligence community. There was not, no pushing. The intelligence community had decided that a, a number of uh, questions had remained unresolved and that Saddam probably retained certain capabilities. We didn't say he had an arsenal. We said that he had capabilities and that he retained the will to uh, pursue these weapons. But the UN weapons the, inspectors were doing their job. We remember the, the man who led the inspections team, Hans Blix, went before the UN Security Council on the eve of the invasion in February 2003 and told the world that there was no evidence that Iraq was pursuing WMDs. And yet the US, Cheney, Rumsfeld and Bush decided to go to war. Well, it was disingenuous because we saw when they sent their inspectors in, Saddam would do activities to try to hide what he was doing in the various facilities. You could see UN inspectors coming in the front gate and you saw the Iraqis moving things out, out of the back gate. Well, where, where is that information from? Because it was they, intelligence. Well, but they we said that they didn't it. find any evidence. It's quite different to the way you've well, just pictured it. Well, first of all, it. we did find stuff. Eventually, we did find the shells that we say were missing. They turned up, unfortunately, in markets and places like that, but some weapons of mass destruction did show up. We also found out that he had retained capabilities, and, and most of the post-war reports 
bore this out, that he was waiting for a breakout period. And you have to go back. How, hold on. How much of this information was provided by the Israeli government? Because some people I've spoken with who worked at the Pentagon, in fact, even worked with you at the time, said there was an important document that outlined the need to destroy uh, certain countries in the region in order to make sure that they were not a political threat to Israel's hegemony, namely Iraq, but also Syria, Libya, and Iran. Well, actually... A and the document is I called the Keen Break document. No, no, I wrote, I wrote that document with a number of other people. It was a jointly written document with about eight, nine other people. Mm -hmm. However, that's not an Israeli document. That's an American document. It actually asks of the Israelis a lot, including to give up their aid. But was uh, it in the national interest of the United States yes. to pursue the objectives in that document? How I so? I believe it was, How because so? I believe that the, the Ba'athist regimes of Syria and Iraq were threats to the region, threats to their people. They were not containable. But how were they threats to the region? They did not have weapons of mass destruction. But they were pursuing them. All of them were. We saw in Syria You in could say this about any country. You could say they're pursuing weapons of mass it destruction. It isn't the weapons that make them a threat. It's the ideology. We see how much of a threat Syria is. Look at Syria now. Its primary threat is to its own people. Just focusing on the Iraq war and the illegal invasion, do you still believe that it was the right thing to do from a, from a U.S. national security perspective? Yes, I do, because I think that if you go back to that period of time, the sanctions were beginning to fall apart. We didn't argue that he had weapons of mass destruction. We argued that he retained the capability, which most reports after the war confirmed. But are you saying that, that launching a war that killed up to a million, perhaps even more, Iraqi civilians, that maimed and killed thousands of American soldiers, that cost the United States trillions of dollars, was worth the price? First of all, I dispute the numbers, but, uh, but yes, but I think these it are was. widely documented. There weren't over a million people killed because of the war. Let's, for the sake of, of argument, say hundreds of thousands of Iraqis killed, thousands of Americans. One forgets Saddam Hussein killed hundreds of thousands of Iraqis in the years before the war. Saddam Hussein was waiting for a period of breakout. The sanctions were crumbling. Saddam Hussein would have eventually gotten his way would have had the sanctions crumble and would have resumed his weapons of mass destruction pursuits and would have continued to genocide against his own people and probably other people. We're talking about the U.S. war, though. Was it worth the price and for what? Yes, because we avoided a much worse phenomenon that was going to emerge in the five to ten years afterwards. Number one and number two, you also have to look Hundreds at Hundreds of thousands today. of civilians killed. You're saying it was worth the price. I don't believe hundreds of thousands of civilians were killed by us. How many? I don't know, but it was it was not a hundred, hundreds of thousands. Even I if do it think was, the Iranians and the Syrians cooperated to kill a lot of Iraqi civilians. I think the Ba'athists and remnants in ISIS killed a lot of Iraqi civilians. I think Saddam Hussein would have killed hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of his own civilians. But does it still justify? Yes, it absolutely. The United States War of Aggression. It wasn't a war of aggression. He had violated the I UN. I just spoke to the ICC prosecutor at the time. Well, he don't... said in no uncertain terms, this was a war of aggression. So well, have countless other people. The ICC is a political institution. It's not genuinely a legal institution. Was the it a war, war of choice? It was a least? war of choice, but it was a war that was fully justified under Saddam's violations of the 1991 ceasefire. It was also justified in American courts by, uh, not courts, but American law by the fact that uh, the Congress had given all authorizations for this war. You say this was a war that was justified. I'm just going to read to you a few of Dick Cheney's false statements. February 2002, Saddam Hussein's regime has had high-level contacts with Al-Qaeda going back a decade and has provided training to Al-Qaeda terrorists. March 17th, 2002, we know that they, Iraqis, have biological and chemical weapons. March 19th, 2002, we know they're pursuing nuclear weapons, and so on and so forth. And none of these statements have been proven to be true. Well, Should they all be held accountable, Dick Cheney and those people who peddled these false no, statements? No, we did on the best intelligence it was. We didn't push intelligence. It's the hard intelligence to believe that community... the United States did not have better intelligence than that. Well, believe it, because the United States 
there was a consensus. There might have been a few outliers in the intelligence community that questioned it, but there was an overall overwhelming consensus in the intelligence community that he still retained a lot of capabilities and a lot of weapons. I remember one meeting with uh, before the war. We were talking about the weapons of mass destruction, and the the intelligence community had the view: you don't need to really look for it. You'll trip over it when you get in there. Which intelligence uh, agency? Which one? Name one of the seventeen. All of them: DIA, INR, CIA, all said That's the same thing. That's just simply not true. There was no, no consensus. No, it is true. I was there. It may not be the consensus, but it's true. You just said it was the consensus. No, I say it may not be the consensus. It's true that they did not, we did not push them for any intelligence. They came up with it. They told us what to think. We relied on their intelligence and their intelligence estimates. And they were convinced that Saddam was interested in nuclear weapons and biological weapons and chemical weapons, that he retained a lot of capabilities, and that he also probably retained some residual arsenals. That was a consensus Again, view. Again, many people would beg to differ, and I've been covering this story for a long, long time. There was absolutely no consensus, and in fact, there was never any statement made by any of the 17 intelligence agencies that Saddam Hussein had WMDs. In fact, many of the United States allies, the French and others, did not pursue the war because there was no evidence. No, they did not pursue the war for their own reasons, but they, they, we had many meetings before the war coordinating with the British and others uh, that, that fairly clearly we all understood that Saddam retained very dangerous capabilities and that he was keen on breaking out as soon as he could and that the sanctions were beginning to crumble. You said earlier that if the U.S. hadn't gone to Iraq, it would have ended up with worse consequences. And you've said in the past it could have ended up with two Irans. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, but it suggests that the invasion had, as we know, nothing to do with the alleged weapons of mass destruction. Would you agree? Well, actually, the, the weapons of mass destruction were not necessarily the most important factor for most of those who were most for the war. But that's how the war was sold to it the American public. It was sold public. in part what happened was that there was a clique in the U.S. government that did not want to go to war, and they wanted to, u to push it into the U.N. because they were assuming that the U.N. wouldn't approve in the end. But the U.N. didn't approve because they were conducting their work. Hans Blake at the time said, give us more time. But we can say, as of today, this was February of 2003, there is no evidence of weapons of mass destruction. The U.S. did not want to allow more time for the weapons inspectors to conduct their work. They did not want to allow more time for diplomacy to work. Isn't that the truth? No. We gave Saddam multiple chances to come clean. He didn't want to for his own reasons. Subsequently, we've heard various theories on why he didn't come clean. Some said that he was afraid of admitting that he didn't have weapons of mass destruction, but he deliberately tried to project the idea that he had him. But, and but frankly, in hindsight, didn't he come clean? He said he didn't have any. And you haven't found any, 20 years but on. But then why did he block all the inspectors from having a clean inspection of the facilities? Mr. Why did Mr. he, Wormser, he did play not. games with inspectors? I went to Iraq twice, and I went in 1998 as well, when UNSCOM was conducting its work, when Kofi Annan went to the country with journalists. I was there, and I was there again in the summer of two, 2003. The United States has tried for years to find any shred of evidence to support its allegations. And the sad reality, the tragic reality, is that in 20 years, you were not able to find anything. And now you say that oh, weapons we of have. mass destruction were not the main motivator, which no, we all knew. You said it before the war. The, most of the, there were strategic reasons for it, not the least of which was the fact that there had been a world of exported terrorism. What, what, hap what happened was that the, you have to remember, this is in the wake of 9-11, which had just killed almost 3,000 Americans. And what was apparent to us was that this swamp of patronage, training, uh, overall tolerance of terrorism or employment of terrorism in some cases had created a situation that it was no longer a Middle Eastern problem. Saddam Hussein again had problem. nothing to do with 9-11. It sounds like the United no, States back then and today in, in talking to you was trying desperately to make the quote-unquote intelligence fit the political agenda. 
No, we didn't produce any intelligence. The intelligence community told us what to think. There was never an inversion of that. What was happening was that uh, we were focusing on a lot of other issues as well, like terrorism. No, Saddam Hussein, I don't think there was very much evidence at all that he was directly involved with 9-11, but he was very much involved in creating a world of terrorism. He was involved with Abu Nidal, with Abu Musa, with many different organizations that also were killing people globally. The problem was that there were three or four regimes in the world that simply used the international terror structures to begin to take their war into the West and kill Westerners is and it, Americans. Is it right to suggest then that the United States used 9-11 and the aftermath of 9-11 to launch what would have been a string of wars. We know that Condoleezza Rice at the time said that this could be the, the, the birth pangs of a new Middle East, that Iraq was going to go first and then there would be Syria and Iran. And well, in fact, there was Iraq, there was Syria, there was Libya, and there could have been Iran. We didn't use 9-11. It was because of 9-11. Nobody thought of invading Iraq just like that before the war. Uh, it, was, it was simply not in the cards. Let me ask you this. If the U.S. hadn't invaded Iraq and basically gotten away with it, would Russia, would Vladimir Putin have invaded Ukraine? Because a lot of people are making the link between these two wars and potentially other wars as well. No, I think he was, uh, I, I, I don't think that, that at all has anything to do with it. What might have something to do with it slightly is what happened in Libya afterwards and the American... Uh, effort to oust uh, Gaddafi. Uh, quite frankly, I was not happy with the deal we made with Gaddafi. But once we made a deal, we were obliged not to pursue a regime change strategy against them a few years later. And we did. And the, I think the Russians felt betrayed by certain promises. They believed that they had been tricked into tolerating what was happening. And I think it really gravely damaged the Russian trust of the United States, the Libyan uh, situation. I think they were reconciled and they knew that we were going to go into Iraq. I don't think they were happy about it, but I don't think that had an effect on their view because again, this we were was above part of a, board. This was part of a broader plan, wasn't it, for the Middle East, to remake the Middle East in a way that suited the United States and its close ally in the region. Well, I think that plan emerged, it wasn't to suit an ally in the region because he wasn't for it. The Israelis just simply weren't for it. You say that Dick Cheney wasn't doing the bidding of, of, of the Israelis, but in March 2002, he made a statement, we know that they have biological and chemical weapons, and he was standing right next to the Israeli prime minister, Ariel Sharon at the time. Are you suggesting that they were not on the same page? No, the Israelis were not on the same page. They were they were trying to convince us that Iraq is not the problem. Iran is. David Worms, our former senior Middle East advisor to former Vice President Dick Cheney, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Last month, President Biden declared in Warsaw, quote, the idea that over 100,000 forces would invade another country since World War II, nothing like that has happened. Amnesia? It cannot be. 20 years ago, Almost to the day, the United States invaded Iraq with 130,000 combat troops and a terrifying air campaign, shock and awe. Biden, then chairman of the powerful Senate Foreign Relations Committee, was the most vocal amongst his peers, cheerleading the invasion. An illegal war, as then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan stated, a brutal war of aggression that may have killed well over a million Iraqis and destroyed their country. 20 years on, still no regret, no apology, and no accountability for what Noam Chomsky calls a textbook example of what was called at the Nuremberg Tribunal, quote, the supreme international crime of aggression. Jeffrey Sachs, another world-renowned American scholar and advisor to three secretaries general of the United Nations, observed last year, quote, the war in Ukraine is the culmination of a 30-year project of the American neoconservative movement. The Biden administration is packed with the same neocons who championed the US wars of choice in Serbia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Libya, and who did so much to provoke Russia's invasion of Ukraine. 
Dominique de Villepin, the French foreign minister who led the charge against the US-led invasion at the United Nations Security Council, also sees a causal link between the invasion of Iraq and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which he says explains the largely acquiescent stance of the global south towards Moscow. And so in short, if history is a continuum, if international law rather than the nebulous so-called international rules-based order, which is so much in fashion in Western capitals these days, is anything to go by, 20 years after a classic war of aggression, the people of Iraq are no less deserving of international justice, of accountability, of dignity than other people. And maybe, only maybe, had justice been done for the first major invasion of the 21st century, other invasions might have been averted. That's all from Mirida Fahri and the team in Washington. Thanks for watching.